Throughout most of the year, we've been uh, hearing readings from the Gospel of Mark. A couple weeks ago, in my first sermon, we did that as well. Mark is this fast-paced, action-packed gospel. But today, we're going we're to switch gears. Instead of reading from Mark, we're going to hear from the Gospel of John. Now, the Gospel of John is a completely different animal than the other three Gospels, right? Um, it was written a generation later. Uh, by the time John writes his gospel, he assumes everyone already knows the story of Jesus. We've got three gospels out there. They've been around for a whole generation. What John wants to do is not simply tell us the story of Jesus. He wants to say, this is what the story of Jesus means. So he doesn't give us, doesn't give us all the episodes, all the different things. He simply picks out about 11 of his favorite stories uh, and say, this is really gives us, and he goes in really deep. He'll spend a whole chapter uh, telling a story that maybe Mark and Matthew give a couple verses to. And so we get to know the characters and what they're thinking and what they say to each other. Uh, and so it's, uh, the, the reading that was assigned for today, uh, the, the assigned reading picks up right in the middle of the story. I hate it when they do that, so we're going to go back uh, and, and, and uh, pick up a little bit before we, we get in there. Um, Jesus has been, been traveling around uh, so a couple of years he spent with his disciples. And as he had gone from village to village, he's, oftentimes he did what we often call, call miracles. But Jesus, uh, in John's gospel, he says they're not miracles, they're signs. They, a sign points us to something. And these are signs that point us to God. Uh, and a new way of understanding who God is and how that we are going to relate to God. Now at the time that we pick up our reading here, John chapter 11, Jesus is nearing the end of his ministry. It's only about a week and a half, uh, and, and he's going to be dead. He realizes if there's anything he's going to say or do with his disciples, he needs to do it now, um, because the, the clock is ticking here. There's time for one more sign to give them. But this time it's personal. It's not a random blind person who yells out at the side of the road, help me. It's a friend of his. His friend's name is Lazarus. And Lazarus has two sisters, Mary and Martha. And Jesus would, would stay with them. They lived in a town called Bethany, right outside Jerusalem. And whenever Jesus would go there, he'd stay with them. But R Lazarus has fallen ill and has died. So Jesus goes to them. We're going to pick up our reading. Um, I'm going to go backward a little bit to uh, start with the verse 17. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many Jews had come to Mary and Martha to, to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to him and she met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. So Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know. He'll rise again on the resurrection on the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back, she called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here, and he's calling for you. When she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, into the village. He was still in the place where Martha had met him. And the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary got up quickly and go out, and they followed her because they thought maybe she was going to the tomb to weep there. Mary came to where Jesus was. She saw him. She knelt at his feet. She said to him, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, the Jews who were with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit, deeply 
moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. The Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of, the, some of them said, could, he not, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. There was a cave and a stone was lying against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, there's already a stench. She's been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did, I, did not I tell you if you believed, you would see the glory of God. So they took away the stone. Jesus looked upward. He said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I know you always hear me, and I've said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. His hands, his feet bound in strips of cloth, his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Today we celebrate a festival, as I mentioned, called All Saints Day. It's time we set aside to remember those who have died, to grieve our losses, to remember the hope that is ours. Now, talking about, talking about death is something that oftentimes is uncomfortable for us, something our culture is not very good at. We spend an enormous amount of time and energy ignoring or trying to avoid that reality, even though we know all of us one day will die. But it's unique for each of us. There's nothing more personal than that, right? Um, the tragic death of a child is different than someone who's lived a long life and dies peacefully at the end. Each circumstance is different. We have to be careful we don't pre presume to know what someone else is going through. To help us think about this a little bit, I want to share with you uh, today two outright lies and some bad advice. Okay? Things you should never say to a grieving person. The first lie um, is this, that everything happens for a reason. That is simply not true. Now, I understand why people say that. I've probably said that before. We desperately want life to make sense, right? We want God to be in control because, you know, the alternative is terrifying. <laughs> say, nothing, you mean no one's in control? I mean, but just because something happens doesn't mean God wants it to happen, right? Uh, or that God even allowed it to happen. As if God was a, was a puppet master pulling strings, you know, saying, I'm going to send a tornado over here, or I'm, I think I'm, I'm going to strike her down with cancer, and I, I think I'm going to send a drunk driver down this road and see what happens. Uh, I mean, God's not a puppet master controlling everything that happens. We live in a broken world where things are not the way that God intends. Things are not the way that God wants them to be. All kinds of terrible things happen. Life is unfair. It's not fair by any stretch of the imagination. And faith is not somehow a magic kind of thing. If we do it right, it somehow will keep bad things from happening. Now, there will be a day when that day comes, when all things will be put right. That's what Kristen read about in, 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 in Revelation. The day will come when all things will be made right, but that day is not today. Here and now, our lives get punctuated by losses, and some of them are devastating losses. Relationships fall apart. Dreams we had of how our life was going to go crumble. People that we love dearly are taken from us. But that is precisely why Jesus came. Because we live in a broken world and he came to redeem and to heal the brokenness of our creation. The second lie. God doesn't give us more than we can handle. That's not true. Again, the assumption is that God is up there handing out uh, tragic losses, that somehow uh, teaching us a lesson or making us better people. Now, we may learn something. We may end up being a better person, but that's not why they happened. I mean, I don't have time 
for a God who doles out losses simply to teach us a lesson. Especially a tragic loss uh, is frequently more than we can handle. A devastating loss happens and, and we just, we collapse. Uh, we can't function. It's then that we need others to carry us because it is too much to do by ourselves. That's what we're here for. That's why we have a church. That's why we're the body of Christ, to, to carry one another, to lift, uh, to, uh, a lot, share the burdens along the way. In light of a significant loss, our job's not to stoically hold it all together. Our job is to grieve deeply and profoundly. Grief is not something bad. It's not a problem that we have to solve or something to get over. It's not something we can even avoid or ignore. Grief is the only way to work through a loss in our life. Okay, here's, here's the bad advice. Never say to someone, don't cry. Right? God created tears, and he created them for a very important reason. When Jesus came to the tomb of his friend Lazarus, what does Jesus do? He cries. The people came with Mary and Martha. They got up with her because they thought, she's going to go out and cry. We need to go out and cry with her. And when Jesus comes, he cries with them. The people didn't say, oh, look at Jesus. What a wimp. He's crying. They said, no, see how much he loved him? Tears are evidence of love. We never want to take away that evidence of love. Certainly Jesus understood the resurrection, right? He said, I am the resurrection. But knowing the resurrection doesn't mean it's going to hurt any less when we've experienced a loss. Now, like Mary and Martha, sometimes we torture ourselves. We say, if only. Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. If only we had gone to the doctor sooner. If only I had not said what I had said it's easy to get caught up in if-onlys. Jesus could have gotten there sooner. Jesus could have prevented Lazarus from dying on that particular day. But in the end, Lazarus still would have died eventually, like all of us do. This was more than just this one particular circumstance, this sign that Jesus was giving. Jesus comes not so we can avoid having any grief in our lives. We're going to have grief in our lives. He came so we could have hope in the midst of the grief in our lives. He raises Lazarus as a sign of hope. There's a lot more going on here than just comforting someone in their grief. It's a promise that Jesus is holding out, that, uh, that uh, something we can hang on to in the midst of our grief. Because when life is unfair, when it's tragic, death is not going to be ultimately the last word that is spoken. Life is. As Jesus experiences death, resurrection, so do we. I'm going to invite the band to start wandering back up here. We're going to sing a song in a second. I want to have you guys get ready here for this. Uh, the hope that we cling to is not that bad things don't happen to us. Rather, the hope is that through it all that we are not alone. Our job as, as the people of God is to not tell lies or give bad advice. All right? That's our task. Don't tell the lies. Don't give bad advice. Our job is to gather, just like Mary and Martha did, to weep with those who weep. We don't have to try to explain it. We don't have to try to make sense out of it. We simply need to walk with those who are in pain. We have a God who has firsthand wept at the grave of a loved one. We have a God who has promised to never leave us, even when the bottom falls out. We have a God who has called together a community of people to be his hands, to be his feet, to, have to be the shoulders that others may cry on. We have a God who has faced death and conquered it. A God who, by the power of the res resurrection, gives us hope of life eternal with those that we love.